This is the fourth annual three-minute thesis final here in the University of Edinburgh, and it's one of my favourite afternoons of the year. It's a real privilege to be here this year as the Master of Ceremonies, but the last two years as a member of the judging panel over there on the right. I'm really looking forward to hearing all of the presentations that we've got coming this afternoon from our finalists. But before we begin, I'd just like to say a few official welcomes. First of all, uh, thank you to everyone uh, who is here this afternoon, online and here in the audience, um, both to enjoy the three-minute thesis final competition, but also the many supporters of the, the PhD students who are presenting here this afternoon. I know they'll really appreciate your enthusiasm and support during the afternoon. I'd also like to thank our judges who are sitting on the table there, and I'll say a little bit more about them shortly. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to thank our three-minute thesis finalists and all of the PhD students and staff across the university who supported the heats that have taken place in schools and then at colleges to get us to where we are today. But before we begin, I'm just going to say a few words about the three-minute thesis competition. The first three-minute thesis competition was held in 2008 in the University of Queensland in Australia. 160 students competed. Since then, it's grown, um, and it has now been, by 2010, it had been adopted by many universities in New Zealand and Australia, and now it is a truly global phenomenon. There are universities across the UK and in pretty much every PhD producing country around the globe. In Edinburgh, we were really keen to take part as soon as we heard about this competition, and the first final in Edinburgh took place in 2013. So each year, we have a series of heats that run at a school level and then at a college level to bring us through to the finalists that we have uh, participating today. But the journey doesn't end there. Um, the winner of today's three-minute thesis competition will then go on to represent um, the University of Edinburgh at the UK final of the three-minute thesis competition at the annual VTI conference, and will also be representing the university on a global scale when they participate by video in the Universitas 21 final. But what are they actually going to do? Um, there's some very simple rules. You have three minutes and one thesis, but your task is massive. I was really tempted to bring my PhD thesis with me today, but it's just too heavy. It's like this thick, it's kind of 90,000 words. The challenge of breaking down that PhD thesis and explaining it in an understandable way to us as a lay audience is just incredibly uh, challenging. The University of Queensland have calculated that to, to read out an 80,000 word thesis uh, would take nine hours. Uh, and we're asking these guys to, to distill some of the key messages and key findings from their thesis in just three minutes. And what they've got to do is they've got to be able to do that in a way that doesn't trivialise or dumb down the research. One of the things that I've really enjoyed in the years that I've been on the judging panel is that after every presentation, I feel as though I've learned one or two new things. And more importantly, I've learned to see the world in a slightly different way because of what the, 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 the finalists have, have shown that they've learned from their research and the way that they conduct their research as well. So they're not just telling us what they've done and what they've found out. They're also giving us an insight into how research is conducted in the many different disciplines and subject areas around the university. And I think that's what makes this event so special for those of us in the university, to get this real taste of the diversity of research excellence that takes place in our institution. The criteria for the competition at all levels is simple but it's really strict and it's really demanding. And I've been asked to remind everyone that the judge's decision is final, um, no debate. Anyone over three minutes faces automatic disqualification. The presentation should be about the uh, presenter's current PhD research topic. It has to be aimed at an intelligent lay audience, that's us. It has to be no more than three minutes and supported by only one slide uh, with no transitions. They're not allowed any other electronic gubbins or technology to support them, no sound or video files, um, no additional props, no handouts, 
no costumes, musical instruments, laboratory kits. It has to be spoken word, so no songs, um, no poems. And it has to be informing us about what the research is, how it's been done, what's been discovered, and why that's important. And the judges will be basing their decisions on, on three main sets of criteria. Communication. Was the thesis topic clear and understandable to the audience? Was its significance communicated in appropriate language? Did the speaker use sufficient eye contact and use their sort of voice in an appropriate way? Did they avoid jargon and explain terminology that was needed to get their points across? Did they get the balance right in terms of how they used their three minutes? Did the slide enhance what they were doing and help with the messages as well? Comprehension. As an audience, were we, as a result of the presentation, better placed to understand their research? Did they clearly outline the aims and nature of their research? And do we now, as a result, know what's significant about the research that they're doing? And did the presentation have a nice logical structure that we could follow? And then finally, engagement. As a result of the, of the presentation, of the oration, do we all want to know more about the research that the, the, the presenters are, are conducting? Did they manage to get across these complicated, um, nuanced ideas and information without dumbing down or trivializing the research? Did they show us how enthusiastic they are about the work that they're conducting as well? And did they capture and maintain our, our attention as an audience? So, not difficult at all. I am so full of admiration for our three-minute thesis finalists. Having spoken to the finalists in previous years, um, I think everyone I've spoken to has said how much they've, they've benefited from, from the experience and challenging themselves in this way. But there are some other reasons why, why uh, people might participate and some of the benefits. So there's a prize for first place, and that's up to £2,000 of international conference expenses for you to share as you wish. It also gives you entry to the UK competition in September and the Universitas 21 uh, competition final in October. We have an iPad for the runner-up. And for the People's Choice, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment, we have an iPad Mini. So the judges will judge the first prize and the runner-up. But here's the really important bit of my talk for you uh, to pay attention to. You decide the People's Choice Award. You, the live audience. Um, so as you arrive today, you've been given a, a voting sheet and a copy of the criteria. Uh, what we'd like you to do um, by the end of the presentations is decide upon the best presentation that you've seen today. Please don't just vote for your friends. Please try and use these, these criteria objectively and vote for the presentation that you think was the best. Which was it? Which one? got you engaged and most excited about the research, um, which really made a difference to you. Sadly, um, this isn't open to those of you watching on the web. It's, it's just the people in the hall. But please do use the hashtag if you are online and let us know which of the presentations you preferred and what you made of the event. And the People's Choice vote is independent of the judges. That's completely down to you, and they will have no advanced knowledge of what the People's Choice winner is. So everyone here gets a vote. Please make sure you hand your vote to the organizers when you leave uh, for the coffee break. So who decides the other prizes? Um, we've got four very distinguished judges with us here today. Uh, Leslie Makara is Assistant Principal for Community Relations, and she ho holds the Chair of Phonology in the Law School. A former Dean of the Law School, she co-founded and convenes the Leadership Foundation for Women in the Legal Profession. Konstantin Kamenev is from the College of Science and Engineering, where he's Chair of Extreme Conditions Engineering. He studies materials at extremes of pressure, temperature, and magnetic field. Until recently, Konstantin was uh, head of the Graduate School of Engineering, and at the moment, he's also on a part-time secondment with myself and colleagues in the Institute for Academic Development. Jeremy Bradshaw is the Assistant Principal uh, of the University for Research and Development, and he's also Chair of Molecular Biophysics. Um, gosh, that's a long bio. Um, 
I've known Jeremy for, for, for many years, but most particularly through his role as chair of the Researcher Experience Committee, where Jeremy really takes kind of leadership in the university in terms of thinking about how we wish to shape the support and educational experience of PhD researchers and early career researchers. And last, and absolutely not least, uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome back Chen Zhao, um, last year's winner of the Three Minute Thesis competition. Chen did medicine as an undergraduate at Peking University, and then came to Edinburgh and finished a master's and PhD in neuroscience. For the last four months, she's been interning with the Global Coordination Mechanism on Non-Communicable Diseases in the World Health Organization in Geneva. Um, and she told me that uh, last night when she came back to Edinburgh, almost her first thought was to be delighted by the, the weather in Edinburgh. <laughs> Probably the first time that I've ever heard that. So, to give you a taste of what to expect, I would like to introduce you immediately to Chen Zhao, who will speak about the power of three minutes. Chen. Three hundred and ninety-four, the word count of my three-minute thesis. How did I manage to put three and a half years of work into such a short script? Well, apparently, I didn't say anything about the experiment that had failed, which was like three years of work. In 2013, I heard the news that Chris West, a colleague from the Scottish Center for Regenerative Medicine, had won the university final. That was the first time I heard about this competition. I thought that one day I might enter it, and I'm so glad that I did because my three-minute thesis experience was a turning point in my PhD. Before entering this competition, the question that I was most scared of was, what is your research about? Why is it important? I didn't know what to say, or maximum two to three sentences. And very often I heard people responding, hmm, your research sounds interesting. And I know it so well that interesting is a word that people often use when they don't know how to continue this conversation. <laughs> By preparing my three-minute thesis, I challenged myself to come up with ideas about how to explain terms that may be so familiar to me, but may not make any sense to others. It also forced me to take one step back from my daily detailed experiments to look at the big picture. Now I so much enjoy discussing my research with others, and very often, I use chunks of my three-minute thesis in these conversations. Some people may think that I entered this competition because I was good at public speaking. That's absolutely not the case. English is not my first language, and even after four years of study in the UK, I was still feared to talk to native speakers. Because I was concerned that they must be judging every single word coming out of my mouth whether the grammar or pronunciation is correct. I was also shy when talking to strangers. At networking events, I never introduced myself, but always waited to be introduced. Because of my three minute thesis experience, I've got several opportunities to give public speakings, to give talks to big audiences, like the Senate meeting, postgraduate inductions, the IAD forum, uh, the Scream retreat, and including this event. Because of these experiences, they have made me less and less nervous about public speaking and become more confident. My view about communication has also changed. I start to introduce myself and got to know so many people. I start to enjoy exchanging ideas and thoughts and learning from each other. I think communication is the first step towards collaboration and innovation. My 3MT experience has also brought me great opportunities. Last year, I went to Chicago to attend a, the biggest neuroscience conference annually. And for the past four months, I had been interning with the World Health Organization in Geneva. I was picked purely because my supervisor got interested in my 3MT experience in my CV, and she watched my video on YouTube. This internship has been an eye-opening experience. I now have a clearer idea about how I can combine my clinical background, my research skills, 
and my interest in public health, all these three together, to hopefully in the future make a contribution to improving people's health. Last but not least, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all those people who had helped me with my 3MT. My supervisor, my colleagues, my landlords and their friends. All of them had given me great suggestions and support. I would also like to say congratulations to the nine finalists on reaching today because I know exactly how much effort you have put on preparing your 3MT and I know how nervous you are at the moment. But I want to say that good luck, believe in yourself and enjoy it. Thank you all very much. So, we're nearly there. So from now until around about 3 p.m., we'll hear nine, all nine presentations. We'll get that amazing overview of the research that's going on, that's been conducted by our PhD students around the university. So each presenter will give their talk. Unfortunately, because of the timing of all of this, we won't have time for questions, but I'm sure they'll be delighted to talk to you about their PhD once the presentations are over with. So at this stage, um, just a reminder, check your phones are silent, no flash photography, and please keep the noise to the minimum, except at the end of the presentation, when I hope you'll join with me in, in showing our, uh, our enthusiasm in the, the traditional way. From around 10 past 3 to 20 to 4, we'll have a break, and there will be refreshments in the foyer available to you. And during this time, the judges will be deliberating on their decisions, and will be counting the votes on the People's Choice Award. Um, could I ask you to make sure that you're back in the room spot on 3.40, uh, when we'll be rejoined by our online uh, participants, and we'll also be announcing the winners and handing out the prizes. And we expect to be finished at about 4 o'clock this afternoon. So just a reminder of who we have uh, participating this afternoon. Mary Ellen Donnelly from School of Physics and Astronomy. We have Alexandru from Informatics. Priya from Molecular Genetic and Population Health Sciences. Amelia from Clinical Sciences. Tomke from Edinburgh College of Art. Maddie from Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences. Katie from Biological and Medical Sciences. Amy from Biological Sciences. And finally, Edgar from Health in Social Sciences. So, our first brave contestant is Mary Ellen Donnelly. Uh, Mary is from the School of Physics and Astronomy, and she'll be opening our presentations today uh, with her presentation entitled Icy Cages and Hydrogen Cars. It's all about the route. She's based in the School of Physics and Astronomy and the Center for Science at Extreme Conditions, and her research is looking at the areas of what happens to the crystal structures of things like ice and urea when you mix them with hydrogen and squeeze them to very high pressures. Um, she's from Les Mahago, uh, is that right? Near Glasgow, and has also studied physics as an undergraduate here at Edinburgh. So like me, you're a KB kid. Uh, Mary, over to you. Thank you. Today I'm going to share with you why I once thought that ice and a little bit of pressure can maybe one day save the world. As many of you know, there's a drive these days to switch to renewable energy sources. And one of the more problematic issues in switching entirely to clean energy is how to power things that are fairly mobile, such as cars or planes. And one of the solutions to this is to power them with hydrogen, which is a very clean energy source. However, hydrogen is extremely difficult to store in large enough densities that can compete with current fossil fuels, such as petrol. And one of the solutions to this is how to, to store them in a material. So what I've done as part of my PhD is look at storing hydrogen in ice, which may sound pretty strange, but bear with me for one minute. So I'm fairly sure you all know what ice is. Ice is a solid form of liquid water. And in ice, the water molecules are frozen into position. And there are only certain arrangements of the molecules that are stable. And these can be accessed by squeezing ice to really high pressures. So for example, if you took some ice out of your freezer and then squeezed it to really high pressures, the molecules would adopt all of the arrangements shown at the top of the slide. However, if you were to take ice and squeeze it with a gas, such as hydrogen, things known as clathrates form. And this is where 20 or so water molecules get together and they form a little cage, such as the one shown at the far side. 
And in the center of this cage is a hydrogen molecule. And these structures, these arrangements, they change with pressure just as pure ice changes with pressure. And in general, at higher pressures, you can accommodate a lot more gas into the, the cages. So what I've done as part of my PhD is take root, different routes, such as either cooling down and then squeezing to high pressures, or squeezing to high pressures and then cooling down, taking different routes to form a clathbed that is completely useless for hydrogen storage. However, by doing this, I managed to access some of the high pressure arrangements at low pressures, such as this one here, which is a mix of a cage and a channel, and at the center it has a spiral of hydrogen molecules. However, this one isn't useful for hydrogen storage. It decomposes at minus 100 degrees Celsius, so unless we have a major ice age anytime soon, we probably won't be using that one. However, by changing the route ever so slightly, you can access different high pressure structures, such as cooling down slightly more and then squeezing to higher pressures, you can access different ones. So maybe one day we will have ice in our cars and that would be pretty cool. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, heroic going first. Definitely the hardest position to go at, except for position two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Um, we'll be live tweeting throughout the final, uh, so I'd encourage you, the audience, and our web streaming audience to do the same. Use the hashtag UOE3MT16. And live web streamers, please don't forget, let us know who your choice is, who you would choose as the people's choice. What you've probably worked out is that I'm desperately filling to try and give the judges a little bit of time to kind of gather their thoughts before we move on to the second presentation. And again, sorry guys, but this is going to get harder and harder as the afternoon goes on. I'm much happier being here than I was sitting there last year. So our second uh, presenter is Alexandru from the School of Informatics. Um, Alexandru is from the School of Informatics. His thesis is concerned with exploring the limitations and applications, especially to cryptography, of protocols for the verification of quantum computations. He's interested in anything that lies at the intersection of computer science, physics, and mathematics, in particular quantum computation, information theory, complexity theory. He's from Bucharest in Romania and has studied computer science and computer engineering at Polytechno University of Bucharest. He enjoys reading, facts, stories about submarines and building things with electronics. Sorry, I do like this story. Um, <laughs> He once tried to combine these by building a remote-controlled submarine and decided to test it in a nearby lake where it submerged perfectly and never came back. <laughs> Perfect preparation for a PhD, many might say. So, Alexandro's talk is entitled The Quantum Computer Lie Detector Test. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. How can we determine whether someone is lying to us? Well, we could use a, a lie detector machine, but suppose we don't have one. Suppose the lie detector test we want is just a series of questions, and depending on how a person answers these questions, we decide if they're being honest or not. Can we come up with such a test? As you'd imagine, my supervisor thought this isn't challenging enough, so instead of doing it for a person, we're going to do it for a quantum computer. You see, a quantum computer is a device that uses strange properties of tiny particles in order to solve certain problems much faster than any normal computer. In fact, it would take even the most powerful computers we have today millions of years to solve these problems. Their solutions would help us better understand the origin and building blocks of our universe, as well as develop new chemicals for innovative medical treatments and new algorithms with various technological applications. So quantum computers would be tremendously useful, and when we have them, it's really important to know that they're giving us correct answers to the hard questions we ask them. After all, even quantum computers can be hacked or have bugs, and mathematically, the simplest way to model these cases is to assume that the computer is as clever and as deceitful as possible. So, how do we make the lie detector test? Suppose I take a bunch of easy questions that I already know the answers to, and I change them to make them look like hard questions. If you've done any teaching before, you know that it's quite easy to take something simple and make it seem more complicated. 
We then mix these easy questions with the actual hard questions that we don't know the answers to, and we do it in such a way that the quantum computer cannot tell which is which, no matter how powerful it is. If it answered all of the easy questions correctly, I'm confident it answered the hard questions correctly as well. But the problem with this is that we need a lot of easy questions to get high confidence. And moreover, the harder the problems we'd like it to solve, the more complicated we need to make the easy questions so that it can tell the difference. So it could happen that it takes me longer to prepare the questions than if I had solved the hard problems myself. Well, in my work, I try to make sure that doesn't happen. What I've done so far is given precise numbers for how many questions we need and how complicated we need to make them. I've shown that these numbers depend on the inner workings of the quantum computer and on how deceitful it's trying to be. But maybe it's not trying to be deceitful, maybe it just has a few bugs or errors. I've shown that we can allow it to, to give us some wrong answers and still recover the correct results to our hard problems in the end. So that's what I do. I try to come up with the best lie detector test for a quantum computer. Thank you. For those of you who have not attended a three-minute thesis final before, I guess you can tell already why I'm so enthusiastic about coming along to this event each year. So thank you, Alexandru. In order to reach the final today, each of our finalists have competed in local level heats in each of their schools. Uh, normally those take place in March, and then there's a college-wide semi-final which takes place in April. Then three, three finalists from each college are selected to compete here today in the university final. So we guess that by the time our finalists are presenting to you this afternoon, um, we're probably getting into the, the hundreds of times to have given this presentation in one form or another. So time to move to our third speaker. Our third finalist is, is Priya Hari um, from the Deanery of Molecular, Genetic and Population Health Sciences. Priya's research began by conducting siRNA screening to look out for genes and proteins which are regulators of senescence that occurs in response to the activation of the oncogene. Sorry, you've lost me now already. <laughs> Geologist. Um, she's now characterizing the role of the protein that she's identified in that senescine. The title of her PhD is Oncogene Induced... S I really hope I'm pronouncing this right. I'm probably not, am I? Thank you. Senescence. <laughs> Uh, that she has identified in senescence. The title of her PhD thesis is Oncogene Induced Senescence and the SASP, the search for a new team member. Priya is from Manchester and graduated uh, in, from medical biochemistry with industrial experience. A fun fact about Priya is that she has done, had a different bedroom every year since 2008 and will continue to do that for at least the next two years. Oh, sort of prediction that a quantum computer would be proud of making. Um, she's very passionate about science communication and widening participation in science, technology, ed engineering, and mathematical disciplines. She works on any science festivals and public engagement events with uh, uh, people of all ages, and is the new editor of EUSI, which I'm really delighted to hear. Priya's talk is in titles, Senescence, the Emergency Break on Cancer. Over to you. Cancer is smart, right? It turns our own bodies against us, taking the very mechanism of cell division, which we need for our growth and repair, and forming unsightly tumours that eventually go on to destroy our organs. But the body is smart too. If your cell was unfortunate enough to get a mutation in a gene that controls the division of your cells, then that cell will start to divide rapidly. In fact, so fast that the division of the DNA just can't keep up. The DNA becomes so damaged that it will send out signals to the cell to slam on the emergency brakes. Those emergency brakes are called senescence. Senescent cells are big active cells, but they cannot divide. What they can do is make the cells around them senescent too. Tumour formation has stopped. It's like senescence is our body's natural weapon against the development of cancer. But clearly, 
with cancer as prevalent as it is, those emergency breaks can be too easily released. Can we create a therapy that can put the emergency breaks back on cancer? That's the question scientists are now asking. But in order to do this, we need to understand, right down to the molecular level, how senescence is being controlled. So to do this, I screened over a thousand proteins, removing them individually from the senescent cells and adding a dye to tell me if they started growing again. Now, if all I had was a basic microscope, that would be my entire PhD right there. Thankfully, we have an automated microscope that not can only take the pictures, it can count the cells too, and that in just a couple of days. So, in this way, I have discovered about 30 proteins that might be important for senescence. But I am particularly interested in two. Two members of the toll-like receptor family. We already know that they play a big role in protecting us against bacterial and viral infections. But now I think they play a role in protecting us against cancer too. Now my job is to work out how they do this and how they communicate with other cells. And in this way, by discovering the regulators of senescence, we might be able to put the brakes back on cancer. I think the precision of the timing of our finalists in their presentations is quite extraordinary as well. Um, fantastic. So, we're a third of the way through the three-minute thesis final so far. Um, the IAD organised a series of specific training sessions uh, to help uh, prepare uh, finalists for the competition. And we also run several competition preparation workshops and a workshop on slide preparation design as well. And these workshops are open to anyone who is thinking of, of entering the competition. And actually, the numbers of, of PhD students who are deciding to enter the three-minute competition, three-minute thesis competition, through their schools and then their college and then their university is, is increasing each year. And as I think as we can all see from the quality of presentations that we've seen so far, this is exactly the sort of thing that young researchers should be thinking about doing during their PhDs. So those of you who are PhD students in the audience, those of you who are PhD supervisors, please encourage your students to consider the three-minute thesis competition next year. And then the finalists uh, are offered specialist um, coaching, voice coaching, and presentation skills training as well. Judges, how are you getting on? Yeah, okay, staying with us, good, good. Presentation four, our next finalist is Amelia. Uh, Amelia is from the School of Clinical Sciences, and her PhD research looks at pure, oh, pure energic, pure. Pure say that again? Pure energic, oh dear, receptors, P, I think I'm getting more nervous now than the finalists, it's a nightmare. <laughs> PX20, P2X7 and P2X4. Um, and she aims to define the role of these receptors in the vasculature, in the progression of kidney disease, and investigate whether antagonism of these receptors may prevent vasoconstriction, decrease blood pressure, and improve renal function in mouse models. Amelia is from Liverpool where she studied as an undergraduate in generic genetics with a year in industry as well. She said that preparing, preparing her three-minute thesis slide, it took a great amount of willpower not to include a picture of her puppy on it. <laughs> this, but if anyone wants to see the picture and can ask her after the competition, she does have a lot of photos, apparently. <laughs> so Amelia's talk is entitled Energy Molecules, Kidney Disease, and the Real Value of Urine. Amelia. Your kidney isn't your most glamorous organ. Although it does a lot of cool jobs around the body, like regulating your blood pressure and filtering waste out from the blood, the end result's always the same, and that's urine. But urine can tell us a lot about the health of your kidney, and as a kidney researcher, I spend a lot of my time around urine. And it's worth it, because 10% of the global population suffers from kidney disease. So there's, what, 100 of us in the room today? 10 of you will suffer from kidney disease at some point in your lives. 
treatment of end-stage kidney disease, so this is things like dialysis or even a transplant, is difficult, costly, and not very nice for the patient. So there's therefore been a surge in recent years to identify and treat kidney disease early on in its progression. What I mean by that is a person can have kidney disease and not yet feel any symptoms, yet already their blood vessels are bearing the brunt of injury. High blood glucose or high blood pressure can cause vessels in the kidney to become leaky and constricted, reducing blood flow to the kidney. This depletes oxygen and scar tissue forms. Scar tissue further damages vessels, which further reduces blood flow, which further limits oxygen, and you can see how the kidney becomes locked into this cycle of kidney disease. The idea is to treat disease at the vessel level before the cycle's even entered. And that's where my PhD comes into place. I work on P2X7, which is a receptor found on blood vessel cells that binds adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And you might have heard of ATP before as an intracellular signaling molecule that cells use to fuel their everyday biological activities, basically an energy molecule. Cells also release these energy molecules, using them to send signals between cells in one part of the body to another, through receptors such as P2X7. The reason P2X7 is so interesting to me is that it's present at much higher levels in both rodents and humans with kidney injury compared to healthy individuals, and this kind of sets some alarm bells ringing. Why is this the case? Is too much P2X7 bad for us? Can P2X7 mediate kidney disease? The answer seems to be yes, because if we treat rodents with kidney disease with a P2X7 blocking agent, stopping energy molecule signaling, their blood flow is restored, and the overall level of injury they sustain is much less severe. The question my PhD asks is how? To investigate this, I look at both healthy and diseased mice, and I see how their vessels function in the presence of P2X7 activators and P2X7 blockers. I also look at their level of kidney injury, which, as I mentioned, involves a lot of urine. They do say, though, that one man's trash is another man's treasure. And that's never been more true than in the world of kidney research. Thanks. So as I said earlier, we're now in the fourth year of the three-minute thesis competition here in Edinburgh. Uh, and last year's final had over 12,000 views on YouTube. It's a really great way to raise the profile of your research, both out there in the world, as Chen spoke about earlier on, as something that you can keep using and keep using to, to publicize your research, and also to get a taste of the research that's going on around the university. So, moving on to our next presentation. Our next finalist is Tomka, from the Reed School of Music, Edinburgh College of Art. In her PhD, she's exploring the structures and processes of new productions in contemporary dance, design, dance theater. This is to understand and improve collaborative, uh, creative collaborations. She's from North Germany and completed her undergraduate at a conservatoire in Germany, the Folkwang University of the Arts. I'm really doing badly today. Um, oh. She's a recorder player by degree, and alongside the music, she's also been an active ballet and contemporary dancer including performances at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Since moving to Scotland, she's discovered Scottish country dancing as one of her favourite dance styles. And her guilty pleasure is cheesy pop music. <laughs> Tomka's presentation is entitled Contemporary Dance and Music Collaborations, a study of cross-disciplinary professional performance. Tomka. Collaboration. Is relevant to everybody everywhere. It's a common term used in job adverts. Here in academia, it's part of almost every grant proposal, and even in interpersonal relationships, it seems vital. How many of you enjoy cooking a meal with your friends or partners, for example? But what does collaboration really mean? Does it mean teamwork, common effort, or thinking? Rihanna featuring David Guetta? To me, collaboration is a process where multiple agents come together to produce a work that is greater than the sum of its parts. For my PhD, I'm looking at new music and dance collaborations in contemporary dance theatre. Here, I expected strong collaboration happening because music and dance are known to be inherently dependent. If you think about a club night out, for example, how would it be without music? And how would it be without dance? So you see, a complex collaboration between music and dance is necessary, but it involves a lot of work and money. So in my case, a company asks a composer to write new music, and then a choreographer is asked to use this music for a new production. 
and the musicians and dancers are the performing artists in this. And this sounds very straightforward, but where can you find the real collaboration here? To find out, I went to sit in the entire rehearsal processes of two new dance productions and talk to the artists involved to trace the collaborative process. Being there, the natural collaboration wasn't that obvious anymore, unfortunately. So for about 90% of the time, the musicians and dancers didn't work together. Also, the dancers and choreographers didn't make use of the expensive music they initially asked for. At the other end of the spectrum, I found the musicians who weren't willing to engage with the dance happening on stage. So, not very much of a collaborative aspect here, right? Be that as it may, it still worked. In the end, new productions were being performed on stage, they received great reviews and actually somehow engaged with the disciplines involved. Now, coming back to my definition from the beginning, is this kind of collaboration really greater than the sum of its parts? I'd say yes, but it was done really differently to what I expected. Limited rehearsal times, different work routines and contracts don't allow for a deep engagement with the collaboration. Also, major responsibility was given to the choreographer, and this led to an imbalance in the collaborative contribution, which now suggests the division of labor as represented in the cockwheels on my slide, rather than the inherent collaboration. So when looking at new music and dance collaborations in the future, I suggest to approach them like cooking with friends. You divide the tasks, everyone tries to do their best, somebody needs to be in charge of the hop, and in the end, you'll get a wonderful new creation. Thank you. One of, the, one of the things that I really enjoy about the, the three-minute thesis uh, final presentations is they give you a real flavor of what it's like to be a PhD researcher. Um, it's, it's hard work. It, it's really hard work. And some of it isn't that enjoyable. It, it's really tough. And then the other thing that is common to PhDs is what you find out isn't what you expect. That's absolutely the heart of all research. You think you, you've got an idea of what you're expecting to find out, and then the reality, once you've conducted the research, is often very different. And that's the really exciting part of being a PhD researcher. Thank you, Tomka. Previous finalists and winners are often asked to speak at a range of university events. Um, one of the, the, the kind of highlights, I think, for the university is uh, the university has a, an organization called Senate which is made up of all of the professors in the university and many other people. And each year, uh, we invite two of the finalists from the three-minute thesis competition to come along to the Senate um, to give us a taste of their research in their area. Three-minute thesis competition winners also present at induction events for new uh, PhD students as well. Um, so as finalists, I'm afraid, we may be calling upon you again and asking for your help uh, and assistance. Our next speaker is Maddie Long. Maddie is from the School of Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences. She works with linguistics and psychologists to explore questions at the intersection of cognitive aging, second language acquisition and the pragmatics of human communication. Uh, she's from Washington DC and studied Spanish and English literature as an undergraduate at Georgetown University. In her teens, she was a nationally ranked tennis player. So, Scotland, you're in the right place. Um, but she peaked young, and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> Maddie's talk is entitled, Language in the Brain, The Sky is the Limit. Over to you. By the time I finish this three minute talk, someone in the UK will have a stroke and someone else will develop dementia. And these numbers are increasing as we live longer lives. But I have some good news. What if I told you that there's something that could potentially double your chances of recovering from a stroke and delay the onset of dementia by five years? It's not a magic pill. It's actually bilingualism. Why is that? Different theories have been proposed, but one of the most influential suggests that the constant switching between languages builds what's known as cognitive reserve, which makes our brains more resilient in the face of disease. Now, as fascinating as these findings are, what about those of us who didn't grow up with another language? That's where my research comes in. I want to know if the same effects emerge if you learn a language later in life and how soon we can see results. To test this, 
I went to the Isle of Skye to a Gallic college offering one week intensive courses. I tested people before and after the week and found that they experienced significant improvement in attention. Now I know what you're thinking. It could happen after any type of stimulating course, right? Not quite. I used the same tests on people enrolled in other intensive courses, and the results were different. They improved, but not to the same extent as Gaelic learners. And it's not just Gaelic. Here in Edinburgh, I tested people learning Norwegian, a language very similar to English, and Turkish, very different. And the results were the same across all languages. You know the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? We can put that to rest. The improvement was found in all age groups, from 18 years old all the way to 78 years old. Now you might be thinking, with such swift improvement, won't the results disappear just as quickly? Well, that depends. I retested over half of the language learners nine months later, and every single person who continued to practice the language for five hours or more per week, that's just one hour a day, maintained that improvement. Those who studied less than that, inconsistent results. My findings show that learning a language can improve brain function in as little as one week, and that with continued practice, this effect is lasting. In a world in which we're growing older and strive for better brain health, this could have a huge positive impact on our lives. Thank you. Please bear, bear in mind the judges. <laughs> They've got such a difficult decision ahead of them. Feedback from Universitas 21 is that the universities with the best social media promotion are the most successful in the U21 People's Choice vote. So please make sure you get tweeting now uh, and also make sure you tweet in October uh, when the Universitas 21 final is run online. We'll be putting details up on our website and sending an email out to everyone who attended today. How are you doing, judges? <laughs> oh, it's so difficult. So, our next presenter, our seventh finalist, is Katie, Katie Marwick. She's from the School of Biological and Medical Sciences, where her research looks at mutations in one gene known to be important for brain function, a neurotransmitter receptor called the NMDA receptor. Her research asks how the changes in DNA change the properties of the receptor. By understanding the changes in brain function caused by these specific mutations, we hope to improve understanding of the causes of mental disorder more broadly. Katie's from Glasgow and is, as an undergraduate, studied natural sciences and medicine at Cambridge and Edinburgh. Uh, she's a psychiatrist, taking time out of clinical to do a PhD. She sings in the University Music Society Choir and enjoys sea kayaking and hill walking. Katie's talk is entitled, How Do Mutations in MM NMDA receptors cause neurodevelopmental disorders. Katie, over to you. You are sitting surrounded by mutants. Every human carries on average 74 DNA alterations present in neither parent. These de novo mutations arise during the development of the egg or sperm that begin us. Most of the time, these genetic typos don't matter. However, sometimes they can hit a sensitive spot, like a gene important for brain function. Recently, the NMDA receptor has been found to be mutated in people with a range of neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism and schizophrenia. Each dot on this receptor diagram is a mutation colored by associated disorder. The NMDA receptor sends signals by allowing ions to flow into brain cells. But it's a very unusual ion channel. Its activation requires not just the binding of its neurochemical, but also a rise in voltage inside the brain cell. This is because normally the receptor pore is blocked by positively charged magnesium ions, which are only expelled when the brain cell is also positively charged. This requirement for not just A or B, but A and B, means that the receptor can link two inputs 
It means that we can form memories. The yellow circle marks the location of a mutation at the narrowest part of a pore, found in a person with epilepsy and intellectual disability. My PhD has asked, what are the functional consequences of this mutation? What are the steps from DNA to disorder? My first finding <coughs> is that the mutation significantly reduces magnesium block. In the normal receptor, the activating neurochemical, glutamate, <coughs> It causes a large inward current, which is virtually abolished by magnesium. However, <coughs> in the mutant receptor, magnesium causes minimal effect. And of course, losing magnesium block will impact on memory. The bottom right of the slide shows individual receptors opening and closing. You can see that much less current is flowing in the mutant receptor. Less signal is getting through. <coughs> In summary, my PhD has shown that this single DNA alteration is enough to fundamentally alter crucial properties of the NMDA receptor, consistent with this mutation causing disease. The broader impact and challenge for the future is using this knowledge to develop personalised treatments for carriers of this and similar mutations. So if you've been inspired by the finalist presentations and you'd like to enter the competition next year, dates for the competition uh, preparation workshops have already been set. Uh, the workshops will be the 15th and 22nd of February 2017 and the university final uh, will be 22nd of June 2017. Um, have a look at our web pages for more information. There's also lots of resources on, available on the IED web pages including blog posts from previous winners sharing their experiences and tips about how to prepare a three-minute thesis presentation. And I'd also recommend having a look at the, both this year's, which will be on the website in, in time, and the ones from previous years as well. So two more presentations to go. Um, Amy and Edgar, you're doing great to stay with us. <laughs> so now we have Amy munro Farr from the School of Biological Sciences. Her PhD is interested in using experimental and analytical techniques drawn from evolutionary biology to answer questions about how and why people make cooperative decisions. Thus far, the questions have largely been studied using simple games in a laboratory setting. Her project tries to find real life situations which are analogous to these games. She grew up in London with a large dash of the Scottish Highlands and also studied natural sciences, zoology as an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge. She recently helped to set up a science art collaboration. Uh, to chill out, she loves to draw, swim outside, and visit friends. Amy's talk is entitled, Human Cooperation in the Wild, Homelessness, and Dog Poo. Amy. Why do people help each other? It's actually a bit of a dilemma. Think about it. Every time you help someone else, they get the benefit, but you carry the cost. If you've ever lived in a flat share, you'll probably be familiar with this problem, where all the flatmates agree to do their fair share of the washing up, and yet you end up with a sink that looks like this. Why is that? It's because although everyone will get a benefit of having clean dishes, no one wants to be the one stuck doing the washing up. We call these kind of scenarios public goods games, and this structure is repeated in global problems from financial regulation through to the fishing markets. And yet, society isn't in chaos. We're actually pretty good at cooperating and helping each other. So what's going on? That's what my thesis is trying to answer. Why do we cooperate? And how do we go about making those cooperative decisions on a daily basis? So, so far, this has mostly been studied in a laboratory where people are going to be intensely aware of the fact that they're under observation. Now, the simplest laboratory game is something called the dictator game, where you give someone some money and you ask them if they want to split it with another anonymous individual. So, I decided to go and try and find a real-life example where people are being asked if they want to split their money with somebody else, people walking past homeless people in the street. And perhaps unsurprisingly, less than 1% of people gave. That's in comparison to around 50% of people in the laboratory. 
So what that tells us is that people do behave selfishly in a non-cooperative way when they realize that there's someone when they realize that they're not under observation. Right. So I then thought it'd be interesting to go and look at what kind of social cues influence these cooperative decisions and decided to some, study a very simple public goods game, dog bone public parks. So, in this example, the individual dog walker pays a cost of picking up poo in terms of time and ich. Um, <laughs> but the benefits of that scenario go to everyone who uses the park. So, I've manipulated my parks by either adding fake dog poo or removing dog poo from parks, and I'm going to and I have established the rate at which dog poo abandonment has changed. Now, the results aren't actually in yet, but the results are really important. If paying to remove dog poo from a public park doesn't actually cause any behaviour change on the part of the dog walkers, there's much less incentive for the council to pay for it. And that kind of result could potentially scale up. If you can understand why people make cooperative decisions about, say, for example, their carbon emissions from driving their car, then that could potentially have huge impacts on global problems like climate change and food wastage. Thank you very much. A quick thank you to all of our audience members for coming along this afternoon and supporting our, our presenters. Um, we've got probably, uh, we certainly had our largest demand for tickets uh, this year that we've had so far. Um, there's a few people who don't look like they've quite made it. Hopefully they're out there in online land and they're uh, they're busy voting in the wonderful referendum today. Um, and what we found was that many of the tickets were snapped up within 24 hours of, of being made available. So the, the, the interest and demand for places at the final and interest in the competition is growing every year. So now um, over to our final, very patient uh, finalist, Edgar Rodriguez Chantes from the School of Health in Social Sciences. Edgar and his qualitative, re qualitative research is interested in understanding how self-identified gay men give meanings to their romantic and erotic relationships and how these meanings entangle with their sense of identity. He takes the stance of the emic or insider perspective, which means that he studies their identities as social realities from their own point of view. Edgar is from Mexico and has a BSc in psychology from the Universidad Inter Intercontinental Mexico City and an MSc in counseling studies. He started writing about women's and gay men's right, human rights in 2000. Um, today, he wants to remember the brothers and sisters who were executed in cold blood at a gay club in Orlando, Florida. Edgar. I'm homosexual and I'm afraid about what my future will be and that people won't like me. For the Project Humans of New York, this boy shared his story last year with photographer Brandon Stanton, who collects stories and provides glimpses into the lives of strangers in New York City. 20 years ago, I also believed that I was homosexual and I was very afraid of facing the world with that label. It didn't take me long to understand what homosexuality means. But now, I am interested in understanding what being gay means. Over five decades, psychology has defined homosexuality and crafted the term sexual orientation. But many of us have abandoned the label homosexual long ago because it has a history of pathologization and illegality that reduces people's objectivities to a sexual aspect. That's why I think of gay identities instead. Research in this area has focused on the influence of broader social aspects, such as national politics, the impact, the impact of mass media in the construction of gay identity, and the homosexual-heterosexual dichotomy. The public portrayal of gay men is highly sexualized, often centered on phallocentric sex. But I'm guessing that this boy, while trying to understand his identity, was thinking about something else, not only sex perhaps not even sex. As in a personal odyssey across the UK, I travel cities and towns listening to gay men's narratives. Through face-to-face, in-depth, unstructured interviews, I explored gay men's experiences of erotic and romantic intimacy and how through them we make sense of our identity. 
Men from various ages and backgrounds told me that being gay means a hundred different things completely unrelated to sexual activity. Being gay can mean having had to leave home when your mom turned her back on you because you loved someone you were not supposed to love. A history of loving in secret and years of oppression. And that's why this research is important because a better understanding helps to eradicate the verbal, emotional, and physical violence that generations of gay people have experienced throughout their lives. But being gay also means intimacy and togetherness, and delight in the eye candy looking at guys who never look back. But most importantly, there's a suggestion that through erotic and romantic relationships, these men are trying to make sense of their lives in a way they couldn't before, as if when looking for lovers, they were looking for meanings because when these men actually look back and reciprocate our desire, serve as an element to validate our identity and corroborate our very own existence. Before I let you go for some refreshment in the foyer, could I remind you that we need you all um, to vote for the People's Choice Award. Um, you'll have been given this voting sheet as you arrived. Please take a moment now to make your selection, having viewed all nine finalists, and leave it with the, 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 the voting desk just outside. So this should be the one that met the criteria, but also engaged you, excited you, or impressed you the most maybe caused you to look at the world in a new way. And your selection will win the iPad Mini at the end of the vote. So everyone only gets one vote, so you should only check one box. Uh, we're going to be back in here, um, spot on 340, so 20 to 4, to hand out the prizes. And so web streamers out there, um, please be ready to join us again at 340. But before you go out for um, a, a break, Please could I ask the finalists to, to stand and just come to the front again, please. I would like you to, the audience to join me in thanking them and congratulating them for what I thought were outstanding presentations. Please, guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to, to the, big, the big moment. Um, I, had, I had quite a lot of, oh, you, see, you see, everyone's excited. I can't get you to be quiet now. Um, I had great difficulty in prizing the judges out of the judging room. Um, it's been such a difficult decision that they've had to make. Just to spin the tension out a little bit longer, um, I'd like to do a couple of very quick thank yous. Um, first of all, to my colleagues from the IAD who've been helping this afternoon, uh, both running the session and indeed uh, throughout the, the time leading. So from Marcin, Heather, Teresa, Ali, and particularly Louise, who's been doing so much work with the finalists and other colleagues to make today's event a success. And I'd also like to thank our colleagues at the back of the room who've been looking after us in terms of the web streaming, the video, and the sound. Thank you all very much. Uh, the judges have had a, a horrendously difficult job to do, uh, and I feel a bit bad that we have brought them a, a, a little present to say thank you. I'm not quite sure. Whilst Quality Street works in terms of a kind of metaphor for the presentations, it feels somehow inadequate for the difficulty of the task we gave them. So that's enough of me. I'm going to hand over to Jeremy Bradshaw um, to give us the results. Jeremy. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, yes, John had to prize us out of the room. It was a very, very difficult decision, principally for two reasons. One, because the standard of quality of all of the presentations was so high. But secondly, because they were so different. Um, and so we were arguing about um, which aspects, which features we, we each felt was most important. So you've all done extremely well. Um, it's all, that's already point has already been made. In getting here, you've, you've, you've done, done really well. We've been really impressed by all of the presentations uh, this afternoon. 
but but we were asked to to come up with with uh, a winner and a runner up and we also have the result of the people's choice so without further ado let's let's go into the results so the runner up this year is priya harry congratulations So to draw out the tension a little bit more, let's now go to the people's choice. And the people's choice, um, which, for which um, we obviously weren't involved in the decision, so we can only guess why uh, the, 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 the choice was made. This is somebody who we felt their presentation was very moving. We felt it was very clear exposition of important research. And we thought that the slide was very powerful. The People's Choice goes to Edgar. And then the winner, uh, the judge's choice, um, this goes to somebody who made their research relevant to everyone in the room, right from the opening sentence, um, and explained clearly very complex, very complicated concepts. The judge's choice for uh, first prize goes to Maddie Long. <laughs> Thank you again for being such a fantastic audience. Thank you to the judges uh, and to Jeremy and the IED colleagues. And thanks most of all to our nine three-minute thesis finalists. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to ask the, the three-minute finalists to stay behind so we could do a few photographs. Uh, but there's still refreshments outside. So if the rest of you would like to go outside, get another drink, please do. And then you can congratulate uh, our winners, our runners-up, our people's choice, and all of the finalists. Thanks again, everyone.